Ah, that's just the only sound I feel like making at the moment. Uh, bad news, people. Um, as you may have heard, uh, Mr. Wayne Kramer, guitarist, songwriter, activist, pioneer of punk rock, and just a good soul. Uh, he uh, he passed away. Uh, we just learned about it uh, a couple hours ago. Uh, Wayne was 75 uh, years old, and to be fair, <laughs> those are some pretty hard miles, but damn it, he was one of the great ones. You know, he's gone. No idea how. It's just fresh news, but man, uh, we were lucky to have him as long as we did. Now, if you're not familiar with him, I urge you to look him up. Spend some time with Wayne's music and story. Uh, he made his bones as the guitarist and founder and primary lightning rod for the band MC5, Motor City 5 out of Detroit. Uh, punk rock pioneers, I mean, from day dot, really. I mean, it was his band that helped sign the Stooges, right? Without the MC5, we may not have heard of Iggy Pop. And then from the MC5, Wayne's path went many places. Uh, he was very vocal in his activism and even ended up spending some time in prison where he not only emerged stronger and wiser, but also more compassionate, uh, honoring the inmates that he met and prisoners around the world with a charity Jail Guitar Doors, uh, founded with Billy Bragg, which helps in the rehabilitation of prisoners through music. And Wayne was always a very expressive soul. He got into experimental jazz and produced some incredible work throughout his life. Anyway, I hope we could honor the man today and going forward. I, I never have the album Kick Out the Jams far from my turntable. And today I'm going to share this conversation I had with Wayne going way back to August 2016, uh, which was part of episode 45 of the Vinyl Guide podcast. Just as we were starting out, Wayne was kind enough to come on and talk about the record, the censorship of Kick Out the Jams, talks about uh, the Stooges getting signed. He talks about all sorts of different things, and we go through his career uh, quite a lot. It's a pretty extensive interview. Um, please enjoy this conversation in full, no breaks, no ads, no nothing, uh, but uh, just a lot of love for uh, Wayne Kramer uh, and everything he's created. Wayne, thanks for the music and the wisdom. Uh, we're a better people because of you. All right, here we go. From August 2016, Mr. Wayne Kramer. Now, here at The Vinyl Guide, we always enjoy speaking with music and history makers. And today we have someone on the line who clearly fits both categories. We're talking to Wayne Kramer uh, of the MC5. How are you doing today, Wayne? Terrific. Terrific. Thanks. To yourself? Uh, doing great. Hey, Wayne, uh, look, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, a lot uh, uh, happened and is happening in your life. Of course, the music, the politics, uh, your successes, some of the missteps, and of course, uh, your charity, Jail Guitar Doors, which we'll dutifully cover shortly. However, for now, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, which came first, the guitar or the politics? The guitar came first. From the time I was a boy, I was um, <clears throat> kind of attracted to it. It was like a, a portal to a secret um, dimension that I wanted more of. You know, the, the sound of the guitar itself was... Um, so, to me, it was the sound of liberation, sound of adventure, sound of power. And at what age did you pick it up, and were you serious about it right away? I was about 10. And yeah, well, it, I noticed in the world around me that people who played the guitar and sang songs, that, that girls really had great affection for them. <laughs> some, some mystical reason that was beyond my comprehension. It just seemed to be a powerful force. My mother dated a guy who played music. He'd come over with his guitar and sing songs, and I could see it in her face, you know. I, I want some of that. That, <laughs> that, that looks good. <laughs> that's always the, uh, uh, that's pretty much the entry point for everyone who plays guitar. <laughs> Can we talk about that transition from when you picked up the guitar to when you started playing in local bands? Well, yeah, you know, it was probably, uh, it took me three or four years. Let's see, I started, I was 10. I started playing in bands when I was around 13. So it took me about three years to to master enough 
technique to be able to play with other people and, and learn songs. And then, you know, 13, 14, 15, uh, we, we literally played, you know, today there's this genre known as garage, garage band or garage music. Um, we literally played in the garage. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what, you know, we would play like at our friends' uh, parties in the basement or in the backyard and work your way up to playing school dances and teen clubs. And then you work your way up to playing record hops and DJ hops and, you know, private functions where they would actually pay you. And, and then, um, you know, I was always on a track to, to being a professional musician. My dream was, you know, to be able to work in nightclubs and, and uh, sleep all day and uh, stay up all night with, you know, very hip people and, and do very cool and dark things. <laughs> and at what age did those cool and dark things start coming into the picture? About 16. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because by the time I was 16 or 17, I was playing in nightclubs. And, you know, when I was a boy, my mother said, Wayne, you know, I want you to do what you want to do with your life. But this business about being a musician yeah, I got to warn you that this is a very hard life because you're going to have to work at night probably. And, and it means you'll sleep during the day. And, you know, there are drugs and alcohol, you know, that are around that world of musicians. And, uh, and there's also loose women. And that ticked all the boxes for you. I said, don't throw me in that briar patch, bear, bear. <laughs> Don't throw me in that brown hat. I couldn't wait to be a professional musician. That sounded like, and you know what? She told me true. <laughs> She's absolutely right. Yep. <laughs> so you started going down this path, and at what point did you form the MC5? Probably about, it started to take shape in my, uh, I think I was in the 11th grade, so I was probably 16, 15 or 16. By the time... I was ready to leave school at 17. We had, the band was formed, named, the personnel was set. They were, they were guys from my neighborhood. I asked around at school, you know, you know anyone that uh, plays an instrument that might want to be in a band with me? And I found the guys and pulled the thing together. And we eventually started to, you know, develop some ideas about, you know, what the heck it was we were trying to do. So this is much or all of the original lineup, Tyner, Sonic Smith, all those guys around age 17 or 18, you guys were already a unit? Yeah, we had a different rhythm section. We had a couple guys that were tremendous players, but they ultimately left the group because they, they couldn't relate to where me and Tyner wanted to go with the music. Because we, we were listening to John Coltrane and Sun Ra, and these guys... They wanted to play roots rock, you know, and the, the bass player was a great bass player in the James Jamerson tradition, the Motown tradition. The drummer was a great backbeat, hard driving hitter, but he didn't want to play free. So, so they left the band, and, and that's when uh, Dennis Thompson came aboard and Michael Davis. And what a rhythm section those guys brought. Indeed. And this is, again, you know, around not quite 20 years of age yet. Uh, and the ideas and the politics that were happening at the time, um, at what point was that apparent that the beliefs and the, the ethos of the MC5 was different than other groups out there? By about 1967, going into 1968, you know, we were young people at a time of tremendous upheaval in America. People, you know, if you weren't there, it's, it's very hard to, to imagine, but the nation was more polarized than it is today. <laughs> mm. That's saying something. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it was um, very volatile. Uh, you know, Malcolm X was assassinated. Uh, I mean, you know, to precede all this was the Kennedy assassination jfk assassination so that you know that's set up that ended this bright shining future that many people saw with the kennedys and uh 
then things things started to go to hell in a handbasket. You know, the Vietnam War was escalating. Civil rights were out of control. And then, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, Manson, you know, it was a, it was a very um, dangerous and exciting time. And with the MC5, of course, looking back now, the uh, the views and the position, the politics is 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 very radical. The MC5 was preaching the changing of the establishment, which is what people are asking for today. Tyner and John Sinclair were in the picture, and of course, their politics colored what was happening with the MC5. Where were you at in it? Was it more about the music or was the message equally as important? Um, I embraced um, the... uh, Initially, it was a culturally uh, revolutionary stance, which, you know, having to, to live through, you know, police violence, uh, systematic government intrusion. It it uh, radicalized me, you know, to be uh, falsely arrested, to be harassed, to be beat by the police, um, to be searched by them. This this helped push me to a militancy about. Um, you know, to a militancy that it, that would express my frustration with the slow pace of change. You know, I was young; I was uh, 19 years old, 20 years old, and and uh, I was right about everything, and I uh, I had all the answers, and I was going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I uh, know a little bit more about a lot less. And um, I'm definitely not going to live forever. <laughs> so if, if if all of a sudden you had a time machine and could visit 18-year-old Wayne Kramer, what sort of advice would you give him? I wouldn't give him any advice. I don't give anybody advice. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably smoke a joint with him. It's unwise. Yeah, I probably would have smoked a joint with him. <laughs> so the band starts going from uh, strength to strength, more and more popularity. Uh, you begin recording. There were a few records that were released around that time uh, on a label called AMG Records. What can you tell us about those recordings? They were our very first um, uh, efforts at, uh, at at making records and and uh, writing songs. You know, we we uh, you know I was playing before the the first wave of the British invasion bands. So my original inspirations were people like Chuck Berry and the instrumental bands of the era, Johnny and the Hurricanes and the Ventures and, you know, all all those like one-off, today they call them garage band singles, you know, Underwater by the Frogmen, (laughs) (laughs) all these, you know, crazed little novelty rock guitar uh, records that that were coming out that that got a lot of exposure on Detroit radio. Um, so by the time the band was, was up and rolling, the British, the first wave of the British invasion had hit and, and we were, you know, as, as, uh, impressed and influenced by, uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and, and then later, um, you know, the, the who became, uh, uh, we, we felt like they were our contemporaries, but, you know, we were kind of in a contest with them to see who was going to take it to the next level. And as a guitar player, you know, I was really impressed with uh, Jeff Beck and am still impressed with Jeff Beck. He's still (laughs) my hero. Um, So, so, you know, we started, we started to incorporate these, these, uh, what was happening, you know, in the world around us. And your first single, the first record, uh, I can only give you everything. And the other side, one of the guys, it was on AMG Records. Mm-hmm. Who was AMG Records? That was Arnold Mark Geller. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a guy with money. <laughs> I wish. At one point, we met a guy who worked for MGM Records as a local um, sales rep. And he had two partners. His name was Cliff Gornoff. 
and they had a partner named Larry Benjamin and Arnie Geller. And they decided this, this uh, triumvirate of, uh, of uh, music business uh, executives, they, they thought of themselves uh, as executives, were going to be a management company. So they wanted to manage the MC5. <laughs> they had no idea what they were in for. <laughs> Well, they had, they had an idea. They We go to this meeting in their office, and while we're in the meeting, the landlord comes to the office and, you know, is pitching a bitch because they haven't paid the rent. They're behind in the rent. <laughs> and then, and then you know, they're giving, us, they're giving us their opinions about, like, drug use, you know, like, you guys can't use drugs, you know, like, that's, that's going to kill your career. Then the meeting ends, and one of them pulls us aside and says, yeah, but uh, can, I, can I get some weed from you? <laughs> <laughs> so these guys were they were they were complete hypocrites and and complete phonies and of course we didn't um we we agreed to to make a record with them but we didn't sign any management agreements with them <laughs> they were crazier than we were <laughs> so you guys saw that at the beginning but you let them release the record which is which is yeah. highly collectible these days do you remember how many of those were pressed at the time i'm gonna guess a few hundred because the main thing was to get it on the radio. If you could get if you could get your stuff on the radio, that's how you sold records. Mm. They got a little bit of play, but they never cracked the um, the big the big radio station in Detroit was called CKLW, and it was broadcast from across the river in Windsor, and it had huge uh, sixty thousand watt uh, capacity, and it would it it would reach down to like. Tennessee <laughs> on a good night. It was it was a hugely influential and important radio station, but they never they never got our stuff on there. Uh, okay, so it was a bit of a hail mary pass to record, make the record, and try to get some airplay and make something of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and just staying with AMG Records because that that was your first record. We'll skip to your third really quick, which is a re release of I Can Only Give You Everything with, but with a different backside, which was I Just Don't Know. Was that also part of the deal, or was that an outtake that they used? That no, that happened way later. Mm. Um, we had already gone through our whole career at Electra Records and Atlantic Records, and Geller showed back up one day and said, "Hey, remember those old tracks? Uh, now you guys are big and famous. Let me release these, okay?" And we said, "Yeah, yeah, sure." And, uh, okay. And nothing he can do either. <laughs> he still couldn't get airplay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and then, and then, just uh, skipping back, just let's be completist here. Uh, your second record was, uh, and I, it was on a label called A Square Records, uh, Borderline, and Looking at You. Uh, apparently, that was released without your knowledge. Is that right? No. No, we were we were completely involved in all aspects of the, of that project. Um, by then, we were we were aligned with John Sinclair, and using the guidance that he gave us, and and he produced the sessions, and we loved the sound that he got. And uh, you know, we all sat around in the basement and and glued those record sleeves together and. Gary Grimshaw did an artwork on the package, and we just loved everything about it. Uh, that's the one with the Coltrane image on the cover, yeah? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And who was A-Square Records? This was a guy up in Ann Arbor who um, worked in a record store. His name was Jeep Holland. <clears throat> I don't think he owned the record store, but he ran it. He was the manager. And... Uh, he had this little label, this little regional territorial label, and he put out records by um, the Rationals, who he managed, and uh, a couple other local bands. And, uh, you know, we we didn't know anything about the label end of it. Uh, so, you know, and we knew Jeep and we liked him. So we said, he said he'd put it out. So we said, great, you know. Mm, okay. Because there's, no there's no money changing hands in any of these deals. This is all on the artist for survival basis. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. You're lucky if you get a box full of the records at the end of the whole thing. Yeah. What, uh, do you remember how many of those were pressed up? You, I mean, you glued them all together. Maybe you, you remember how many you, you guys assembled? I don't know the same thing, you know, probably 500. 
and they you know they've all been reissued over the years but so the the popularity starts building of course the the country is shifting in in many different ways uh one of the events that really started defining the MC5 was the gig at the Democratic National Convention in 1968 in Chicago. Uh, how did you guys get involved and booked at that event? Well, we knew, you know, we were friendly and, and, uh, and uh, you know, in touch with uh, Abby Hoffman and uh, Jerry Rubin. And, uh, you know, we all, there was a great network of young people that, felt that the nation was going in the wrong direction and that, you know, it was going to fall into our hands to clean up the mess. uh, And we wanted to change it. Um, And so, you know, we, they reached out to us. They were going to do a a music festival to, they were going to call it the festival of life um, to oppose the convention's festival of death. And, uh, you know, they said all the bands were going to come and play, you know, the West coast bands were going to come and, and we, you know, we had, we, our attitude was we would play anywhere, anytime anyone would let us. I mean, uh, my attitude about how you, how you promote your band is you play a lot, you play every chance you can get. And we like playing for, outdoor events and we like being involved with um the people and the community that we were in and uh and we had done a lot of it and and so when they said do you want to come to chicago and play we said hell yes count us in we're there and were there any other bands that played besides the mc5 or not one yeah. they all had way more sense than we did <laughs> And that was quite a long show for you guys. Do you remember the length of it? No, it wasn't a long show, but mm. that's a great rumor. Okay, yeah. The rumor is six-plus hours. <laughs> yeah, that's a great rumor. I love that rumor. <laughs> have you ever Have you ever played a six-hour show? Hell no. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> if I play an hour show, I want to go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Twenty minutes is good for me. I can really rock it for twenty minutes. <laughs> well, that's you got. You guys put out a lot of energy, and uh, when it comes to uh, the shows, uh, you guys then uh, on the back of that DNC show started attracting label attention. Yeah, it, yeah. If that's not a rumor, okay, good. Um, and Electra came knocking and uh, and and signed you. What do you What do you recall about those conversations with Electra? Well, they had a guy that was kind of their talent scout who was very sharp, very erudite. Um, his name was Danny Fields, and he came out to see us. And we, we met him through some mutual friends, and, and he was a brother, you know, and he, he we liked to smoke weed like we like to smoke weed, and and he was politically astute and culturally uh, plugged in. And we liked him. I liked him a great deal right from the beginning. And um, he reported back to his, his boss uh, in New York that, you know, this, this band could draw 3,000 kids. And, you know, they'd never had a hit record or anything just on the strength of their live performance. And that, you know, this was a band that was going to, that if they could convert this regional success to national and international success, they'd really have something. And they had just come off a huge success with the doors. So they had uh, money to work with. And um, uh, we agreed that we liked their, poli- their, their political awareness. They said that they would stand behind us uh, that they believed uh, in, in uh, First Amendment and that if, you know, if we wanted to curse on a record, they would have no problem with it. And they had attorneys that would defend us if it came to that. And um, we said, great, you know, these, these are our, these, this is our company. These are our people. Let's roll. Let's make this album. Let's, let's carry a message. There was a kinship and they were saying all the right things. So uh, it wasn't going to get any better than, than Electra. 
I, yeah, I think that was that's that's our position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you were signed to Electra, and actually, you, you you were one of two local bands signed to Electra. They uh, uh, swabbed up the Stooges at the same time, I believe. Yeah, I, w- I was in the room when uh, when uh, Danny Fields said, um, "Are there any other bands like you around?" And I said, "No, there are no more bands like us, but there's a we have a little brother band that you might find uh, interesting. They're called the Psychedelic Stooges." And he, of course, loved the Stooges. And we were we were sitting in Sinclair's office in the basement of our of our commune, and we had uh, Danny was there, and he had his boss on the phone, and Sinclair was there, and the Stooges manager was there, and I was there, and uh, Danny's talking to Jack Holtzman in New York, and he says, "Okay, I got I got both the band managers here. Um, what are we What are we going to do?" and he comes back. He says, "All right, Jack's offering ten thousand for the big band and five thousand for the little band." <laughs> and we all said yes. <laughs> <laughs> the next step was then, of course, to to record the debut album. Uh, did you have the songs ready to go, Is, or was uh, was there a, a matter of preparation that needed to be done? No, I came together pretty quick because. You know, all our work went into performing live and and building this live uh, set that would just, uh, you know, devastate the audience. We, you know, just we we wanted to just be a a blast of energy that no one had ever experienced before. Um, to the exclusion of recording. We didn't spend much time at all recording. We would write new songs in the rehearsal room and work them up, and it was all about playing live. So the idea to to do a live album, on one hand, appealed to us because it was revolutionary. You know, nobody had done that before. Usually bands did two or three albums and then did a live album, and... Uh, but but there was also the consideration from Electra's point of view, which was this band is you know uh, a music musically verging on chaos, and to get them in a studio and to get them to conform to the recording process was going to be a long and expensive undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, it, su- it suited their purposes to do a live record, and, and uh, what did we know? We went with it. Sure, sure. So what better way to market a band that has these dynamite live shows than to record a live album? It makes yeah. it makes perfect sense. Uh, now, the uh, sequence of the album, uh, was that pretty much the sequence of the live shows? or uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's very close, yeah. So if you listen to Kick Out the Jams, that's about as close as you can get to, you know, having the real experience of an MC5 live show back in the day, sequentially and everything. Correct. Let's talk a little bit about the recording of the album. It was recorded in Detroit at the Grand Ballroom uh, across two days. What do you recall about uh, those shows? Well, it it was the Grand D Ballroom, Grand D. Uh, That's the way we pronounced it. Um, the venue was a, an old uh, 1930s and 40s ballroom dancing uh, facility. It was a be- in its day. It was a beautiful structure, uh, and these kind of ballrooms were, I think, probably all across the country. But I know that they were all across the city of Detroit because in the eras before radio, um, you know, people would go out dancing. <laughs> in these beautiful ballrooms, these lovely Rococo, you know, giant, they'd hold a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dancers, wooden dance floors and and the proscenium stages where big bands could come in and play and the acoustics were very live, very hot room and the bands, you know, you the sound would project out with acoustic instruments and uh so by the time we got this place in the '60s, it was it, it was perfect for us um, to um, to to re- we rehearsed in the venue and we performed in the venue. So we were able to 
to really learn how to play at maximum volume and how to make you know how to make it sound good in that room and uh so we recorded the stuff on friday and saturday nights um we just made it a special two-night recording concert um and all the fans came and they acted the way they always acted at mc5 shows and all the stomping in the beginning the anticipation and then the band rushes out on the stage and everybody cheers and jc crawford does his intro and gets everyone even jacked up to a higher level of, of uh, excitement. And then we, we break into Ramblin' Rose and we, we tear the roof off the sucker. <laughs> and uh, Ramblin' Rose... Oh, but, go ahead. But, yeah. uh, since, since we're, since we're, we're mm-hmm. going deep, mm-hmm. I personally, I can't speak for the other fellows, but I was intimidated by the pressure of making the record and I was very nervous. And when I went out to start Ramblin' Rose, when I slid down and hit that first open E string for the bong, bong, boo, da, bong, boom, my E string went out of tune. And it, it, it threw me. It took me off my, out of my flow. And I never quite got it back. <laughs> oh. And that's the one that's on the finished recording? Because you guys recorded a couple of shows, so that's the take that was used, a slightly out of tune E string. Yeah, you can hear it. I think the first note is in tune, and then from there on it's... <laughs> okay, I'm going to I'm gonna listen for that. If you, listen, if you listen to Kick Out the Jams, you'll hear the, the dissonance between me and Fred's guitar. It's, it's pronounced. I isolate. I have a master recording of the session, and I I put it out on the computer and listened to it and isolated the tracks. And it's I don't know. It could be a semitone. It could be. It's pronounced. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and the and is is that the? Uh, it was that way for the rest of the show. Yes. Okay. There wasn't a time to recoup. No, because you know there were no electronic tuners in those days. We tuned up with a harmonica. Mm. by ear and and you know we didn't really we knew a little bit about how strings stretch over the court you know like but we didn't know like as much as i know today i know how to stretch my strings out before i go play and they'll stay in tune but we didn't know that then so you'd put a new set of strings on tune your guitar up go out and play and you know by the second tune your guitar is completely out of tune (laughs) (laughs) So you hit the E on Ramblin' Rose. Uh, now, Ramblin' Rose is, a, is, is an interesting uh, opener, uh, particularly since the lead singer doesn't sing on it, at least your version right. of it. Um, what was right. the decision like for you to sing that song, particularly in the falsetto voice? It, you know, it was, it was just my... It was aspirational. I don't know if you've ever heard the original... Uh, by Ted Taylor, but you know Ted was a, a rhythm and blues artist from somewhere in the South, Memphis maybe, and he was a brilliant uh, producer and songwriter, and he had a unbelievable voice. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys that had like five octaves he could sing, and he sang it in a falsetto, and I aspired to sing it like he sang it. If if you ever hear the original, you'll hear the difference. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll, he, we'll hear what you were going for. <laughs> yeah, I, I, let, let, let's say I fell considerably short of the mark, <laughs> but I did it anyway because I'm you know I'm twenty years old and I'm um, I'm all I'm all fired up and I'm good to go and. Uh, I'm in my band and I'm singing this shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck you if you don't like it. Um, yeah, I'm not singing it. <laughs> so uh, then, uh, after that song was was Tyner off stage, and then after Ramblin' Rose, he would come on and start to kick out the jams bit. Yeah, he he'd come running out, you know, like we'd finish that tune. I'd I'd come out and start the set, and I'd you know the band would be slamming, and I'd be dancing all over the stage. And then Tyner would come out, and you know the level, energy level would would ratchet up another notch, and 
I mean, it was, you know, we had designed it to be as exciting as it, as it could be. We, we were really trying to, to uh, reproduce uh, James Brown live at the Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. The band comes out, warms them up a bit, and then all of a sudden, here comes the the centerpiece. And uh, yeah, okay. So um, Tyner would come out. He'd say the famous line, "It's time to kick out the jams, motherfucker!" And then, wham, the crowd would go crazy. So that was another another yeah. level there. Now, it, yeah, the first pressings of the record had him saying, "You know, motherfucker," and. Uh, subsequent pressings, that was changed to brothers and sisters. Uh, what was the discussion like behind the scenes when that change, when that switchover was made? When, you know, we we were not uh, completely naive to the world we lived in. And we knew that Kick Out the Jam's Motherfucker would never be a hit single on the radio. That was beyond, you know, reasonable, logical possibility. <laughs> you guys had big dreams, but they weren't that big. Yeah. I mean, we used to say, you know, I may play, but I'm not always dumb. <laughs> so so what our, we had a strategy. The strategy was we'll record a version, kick out the jams, brothers and sisters, for the single. Have Electra release the single. Let the single go as high as it could possibly go in the charts. Leave it in the charts as long as it's going to stay up there. And when it comes down out of the charts, release the album with the real version of the song on it. We knew, just like the live show, everything would ratchet up a level. But they couldn't stop us then because we would be a bona fide radio hit band. Mm. So what happened is they released the single. The single was number two in Detroit. It was number six in New York. It was on the air in Chicago. It was on the air in San Francisco. Both of the rating services that radio used to pick their hit records, had picked the record as a smash hit. Um, when the single took off, Elektra ignored our strategy and released the album immediately. In the following week, kids' parents hit the roof. When the kid came home with that record and they heard Kick Out the Jams, motherfuckers, parents went insane. People that ran record stores that were selling the record were arrested by the police for selling pornographic and obscene material. There were actual arrests made for selling your record. Yes, the, the prosecutors went into high gear about, we have to prosecute this band for saying what they're saying. We can't allow it. Electra came to us and they said, you know, the rack jobbers are returning the records. Um, they refuse to play any of our any of our stuff. They won't even play switched on box, you know. <laughs> we're losing terrible money here. You know, can we put out a clean version of the album? You know, we're, we're dying here. And we said, guys, we told you what to do. You didn't do it. Now you created a problem. And you know what? You can, we will not allow you to release a clean version of the album. That would make us look like complete sellout. Like we crumpled. And they said, oh, okay, well, it's in your contract. You have the right, and, and all right, then. Okay, guys, yeah, we wish you'd decided differently, but okay. And then they went back to New York, and they released it anyway. And what was the first uh, time that you, were, you became aware that they had gone against your wishes? And what was the reaction? Oh, I was furious. I mean, we were all livid. I mean, we were... We were <laughs> I mean, this was bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was bad for, for us. It was bad for our relationship with our audience. It was bad business. It was short-sighted. It was, it, was, it was a mess. And then, you know, they, we had a buddy who ran an underground newspaper who was, uh, they were about to get kicked out of their office. 
so we said, let us let us buy an ad. We'll buy an ad for the album. And there was a big department store in Detroit called Hudson's that we'd all gone to all our lives. It was an institution. And Hudson's refused to sell our record because of the obscenity. And so we put on the ad, uh, kick out the jams, now available, uh, fuck Hudson's. <laughs> You called out the the uh, the store right by name there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and put the Electra logo on it and sent them the bill. <laughs> Since we had we had the right in our contract to do our own advertising, mm-hmm. so Electra determined that we were unprofessional, and they dropped us from their label <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Well, with with Kick Out the Jam still in the charts, still selling well, they they cut the they they pulled the ripcord. Correct. Oh, okay. And how many hours was it <laughs> until you had an offer from a different record company? Oh, it took a few days. <laughs> Let me tell you, Danny Fields, the guy who who signed us, got into such a fight with his superiors that one of them slapped him across the face over the, over the MC5 problem, and they fired Danny. And did he stay in the MC5 camp for a period of time afterward? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted him to manage us. He, did, he didn't want to be a manager. I said, come on, because Sinclair was going to the penitentiary, mm-hmm. and we needed management. And I said, Danny, you know, you're the, you're the man. You're the, you, you're the guy that's managed the band. And he didn't want to do it. Later, he went on to manage the Ramones, and of course, the Ramones have become a, a you know, very popular and successful band. Mm-hmm. But uh, in these days, he 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 just he didn't know what he wanted to do, and yeah, and management is a terrible job. So I, I don't blame him for not wanting to do it. But you guys still had his counsel, and I'm I'm assuming he guided you through the next yeah. steps of the career. Um, and and Correct. and uh, the the next uh, now uh, before we move on, were you happy with the album Kick Out the Jams with the recording with the the process aside from the controversy and the challenge with the with the, with the motherfucker and everything? Were were you happy with the record? To be completely honest, I was not happy with the record. I, I Jack Holzman, Electra president Jack Holzman, said to me, Wayne. If you don't like the recording, we'll just record it again until we get it the way you guys want it. And I said, I didn't like it. And I was outvoted. You know, Sinclair loved it. Holtzman loved it. The rest of the, I don't know what the rest of the band thought, but I, I said, I, I said, it wasn't a great performance. You know, the MC5 was a uh, mercurial band. And on a good night, it was absolutely astounding. But, you know, we didn't have good nights every night. Some nights we'd just be off and, you know, things wouldn't fall together. And they, in my opinion, they didn't fall together that night. I thought it was not a, a good performance of the band. I had better performances recorded on my own reel-to-reels that I did just to hear what we were playing of, of nights that I thought, that you know, man, this, this shit is cool. Mm-hmm. So, and then the artwork... You know, they showed us some some mock-ups of artwork, and and it was very this very cool technique of uh, of uh, kind of superimposing one photograph over over another. And I said, yeah, I love that. That looks great. And then what came out? I don't know. It looked kind of garish to me, and uh, I didn't like the photograph of Tyner and. I just thought it was like a, a, a big mishmash. And, and the art director at the label puts his own picture on the album cover. He's up in the corner. You see this, this white dude with a blue business shirt on and a tie and glasses. He's the art director. He puts, his, puts himself on the record. He was, he's, the guy that slapped, he's the guy that slapped Danny Field. So... You know, I you know I thought I thought Sinclair's liner notes were cool. They were they were very provocative and mm-hmm. and you know accurate for for how we felt. And and then you know they took those off and issued this quote clean version of the record. And, uh, you know the whole thing was kind of a debacle as far as I'm concerned. 
I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to take anything away from anyone's enjoyment of the record. It's a great historical artifact of a great band, uh, you know, and a great night. I mean, you can feel it. It's exciting, and and it's uh, it's unlike anything else that was happening in that time, and um, and I'm very proud of it. But you know, you asked me, and I, I'm going to tell you tell you true. You know, <laughs> sure, no, that's fine. And, that's, how I, that's how I feel. And and I don't quite honestly, Wayne, I don't think it diminishes anyone's. Uh, appreciation of this record because it really is just like you said a historical artifact that's a you know it's a it's a timeless record it, i mean y- how many thousand artists bands musicians have been inspired by this but but in your mind uh and in your experience there were better nights to record you would have liked to have uh uh ha- had this a package that uh, uh based on your experience of what the band did best and 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 recording the band yeah. at its best have you come to yeah. be okay with it are you are, are you now more appreciative yeah. now than at the time i love it you know especially when i i uh when i got the multi-tracks and i was able to really analyze them from you know from this perspective today of in the era of quantizing and auto tune and you know to hear how out of tune <laughs> the guitars were and how you know the tempo rushes forward and bogs back and you know the vocal pitch and everything and it, i just think it's wonderful now <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it's it's it it uh it, it is definitely a moving record uh and uh yeah there's nothing sterile about it it is true <laughs> oh is it your favorite MC5 album or no no yeah okay so let's talk about no, the atlantic no. years so you you guys moved to atlantic uh you start recording what became uh back in the USA yep uh and what was that transition like from uh electra to atlantic very painful mm. because first of all we lost john sinclair John uh, had a pre had a his third conviction for possession of marijuana, and he had a long vendetta against him by a Detroit police narcotic officer, uh, Lieutenant Warner Stringfellow. He had arrested John originally, and John was a poet, and John wrote a poem called "The Poem for Warner Stringfellow," and in that poem he indicted Warner. And, and really ripped him a new one. And Stringfellow got, took it personally and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix you, you rotten motherfucker. And he did. And he arrested John two more times for possession of marijuana. And in those days, the third conviction for, for possession of marijuana was a mandatory nine and a half to ten years in state prison. John gave two joints to a female undercover police officer who he was trying to get in her pants. And he thought, you know, if he give her a couple of joints, uh, he might have to get, get a little something, something. And, uh, and she turns out to be the police. So he had this case pending, and it finally had gone to trial right at the period of that transition for Kick Out the Jams to back in the USA. And John was ultimately sentenced to nine and a half to ten years for possession of two joints of marijuana. So it was a very painful time for me and the band, you know, because John was our mentor and our manager and, uh, and, and our interlocutor between us and the business world and, and, you know, authority and everything else. And, and, uh, so there we were stuck with, uh, you know, Danny had jumped into the picture and tried to hook us up with some professional music business managers from New York City, which all turned out to be a huge disaster because none of them could relate to the MC5, you know, culturally, musically. They just took us on because we had a record in the, in the charts. You were a product. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Those relationships all, you know, were fraught with uh, uh, painful complications and failures and 
And, and uh, you know, back in the USA was a tough record to make because the band had no real experience with the recording process, the rigors of the recording process. And uh, especially uh, the rhythm section, you know, we had developed this way of playing that was idiosyncratic and, you know, tempo was a flexible thing and uh, tuning was, was imprecise. And, and although Fred and I were, were good guitar players and we played, you know, consistently, Fred was a, a impeccable rhythm guitarist and really powerful, solid rhythm player. And I'd learned how to play rhythm by playing with him. So if we locked into a pattern, we were going to kill you with it. And, uh, but the rhythm section um, was a lot looser. And, you know, we encouraged them to, to play outside and, and to improvise uh, like our heroes, you know, Elvin Jones and Sonny Murray. And if you ask Dennis Thompson today, he'll tell you Elvin Jones is still his, his favorite drummer. And, uh, and Michael Davis as a bassist, um, had, uh, he had no experience playing the bass when he joined the band. So he didn't come up with, uh, you know, any training about how the bass fits with a band, uh, you know, what, any musical theory training, like what notes fit with what chords, um, so he just kind of improvised his own style from the beginning and the guitars really carried the the music um so he so his playing was very loose and and uh, spontaneous and uh and uh undisciplined so he would for example uh, think nothing of missing chord changes <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he would, he'd blow through chord changes and he wasn't even conscious of that he missed the chord change. He just, he's jamming, you know. He's roll on. <laughs> yeah, and so we're in the studio and we're trying to make this record and we're listening to the playback and it's like, yo, Michael, you know, you just missed the change. Oh, really? Oh, uh, and, you know... We, we, hadn't even, we hadn't even gotten to the technological point of punching in uh, parts mm. yet. It was, we were still recording the band, the performance live, so we'd have to go out and record the whole song again, and he would miss the changes again. So, you know, this, this is like turning into weeks and months of recording and not having anything worthwhile. And we ended up, uh, John Landau, who of course has gone on to great recognition as uh, Bruce Springsteen's manager and, and producer, um, was working with the band as as our producer. We were his first production project, and John's a brilliant man, and he could re he really understood music, and he he, he could play a little bit too. He, he may have even had some training. And so he, he, he understood it culturally and he understood it personally and, and, uh, and he was able to see what was happening in the band, where the strengths were and where the weaknesses were. And he had come to the conclusion as the producer that we needed to, to record the record from the ground up with bass and drums so that we had the bass and drum tracks correct, then put guitars on, then put the singing on, then put percussion or whatever else and then mix it. And it was a real laborious process and I ended up playing all the bass parts. Michael wasn't prepared for the, the rigors of it and and uh, so I played them. And that style of recording is the antithesis of what you guys were used to and what you showed with Kick Out the Jams because rather than recording you as a live band as one unit, this is more of an assembly line studio work yeah. so it, it correct so it, it really becomes it, it really uh doesn't have the the energy uh the band isn't playing together it's it's pieced together correct uh some of the tracks still came out very well I, I, and you know we we were criticized so severely for 
the looseness of uh, kick out the jams. You know, you got to remember, I was a young guy. I had poured my heart and soul into this band. And uh, when Kick Out the Jams came out, we, we got some brutal critical uh, reviews. And in those days, and especially at my age, those really got to me. And, you know, I admit, I, my feelings were hurt. I felt embarrassed. I felt emasculated. I felt like, you know, they got this all wrong. Uh, you know, who the fuck are they, these fucking writers, you know? And, <laughs> you know, Lester Bang said that we couldn't tune our guitars, and, you know, that pissed me off. <laughs> Even though he was right, we couldn't, but <laughs> it still pissed me off. Because I knew we could play, you know, especially me and Fred. We, you know, we were good guitar players, man. We know how to play. And uh, and so w when it came time to make the next record, a studio record, I was determined to answer my critics. And I wanted to make a record that everything was in tune and the tempos were correct. And, and you know, the, the political content was to the point and and there was no fat on this record. And, uh, and this is in the, you got to remember, this is in the time of the 20 minute drum solo and, you know, the 30 minute guitar solo and the 15 minute bass solo and, you know, songs were 12 minutes long and, and it, you know, every song on that record is like two and a half minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. The longest one is uh, 303. <laughs> yeah. That's a Chuck Berry tune probably. Actually, no, no, no. 416. Let me try. So, oh, uh, so salad. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to have one. So, so what is what in your mind? What's the highlight of back in the USA? Human being lawnmower is the is the uh, apotheosis of, of that period. I think Tyner Tyner wrote that tune, and he wrote the music. He, he came. He bought the tune in he, like. Him and I were in the in the beginning. Him and I were the songwriting team in the band. We wrote all the songs on "Kick Out the Jams." Rob Tyner, Wayne Kramer. We credited everybody because we were we were communists. <laughs> but uh, Rob and I wrote the tunes. So he so he brought the tune in to me, and like him and I were going to work it out, work out the arrangement, and then we'd present it to the band. And you know, he shows me the opening riff is the do 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 ba do bong 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 I said great so I repeat that again he said no I said what yeah it's a great riff Rob so I repeat that four times right he said no you just play that once the song was through composed nothing repeats it's it's figure upon figure upon figure in, in a kind of, you know, cinematic, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I do today, scoring film and television. That's what, it, you know, through, through Compose is not song form. Song form is A-A-B-A -A -A or A-B-A-B. -A -A and it revisits a particular you know, theme, but you're not building on a theme in this particular case. Correct. And, and he, he had the whole thing in his head and had it all worked out. Fred and I added some changes over the guitar solos to open that section up a bit. But Tyner came up with the whole thing. He was such a genius. Um, and, and almost everything he did, I mean, he was, you know, he was the first guy that he designed his own clothes. Uh, you know, he was a great uh, uh, graphic artist. He was a great cartoonist. He was a poet, lyricist, a dancer, visionary. I mean, he was, he was, there was, there was no one like Rob Tyner. And he was really into jazz and hard bop and Coltrane, Archie Shepp. Yep. How did those influences permeate into the MC5? Well, he turned me on to it. And, you know, Fred and I had both, we knew about jazz from listening to jazz guitarists, you know, Jim Hall and Munda Lowe and Kenny, Kenny Burrell and, so, you know, we knew that as guitar players, you know, we're listening to all the best guitarists and their best guitarists are the jazz guys. And and then, uh, you know, we, we had been listening. We had heard my favorite things, Coltrane's record. And, uh, you know, we were impressed with the whatever it was, 18 minute version of the tune. Um, 
and then you know Tyner kind of opened our ears up even further to the hard bop, like you said, you know Jackie McLean and Cannonball Adderley, and and then uh, Sinclair, you know, busted the busted it all open with the free jazz movement, the uh, Albert Eiler and, and uh, Sun Ra and Cecil Taylor and. And we would listen, I listen to these records all day, every day. And after Back in the USA, there was one final album, High, High Time. Um, what's your recollection yes. of... That was the best record the MC5 ever made. You know, you, forgive me if I'm being redundant, but, you know, Marshall McLuhan's take on media, that there is hot media and cool media. And, uh, you know, you go to a live performance, that's a hot media. You know, you're there in the room, you can smell it, you're sweating, the lights, the band's playing, people are moving, you're getting jostled around. It's a very physical, uh, uh, visceral experience. Uh, listening to a record is a cool media. And, you know, you put the record on and you, you wash the dishes, you put the record on and you make love to your girlfriend, you put the record on with you're hanging out with your friends and you're listening to music or you're in the car, you're listening. So they're two different parts. And the MC5 had the live thing dialed in pretty good. But it took us three records to, to learn how to make records, to, to be creative in the recording studio. And we did that with the third album. The songwriting had matured. Um, the playing had matured. The technology had matured. We we had a new producer, and we had the technology to uh, punch in where... So, so we knew that, like the rule was on the sessions, if we're playing a tune and everybody knows where they're at in the tune and the, it's sounding good and Michael misses chord changes, don't worry about it. Keep playing. Keep playing it how you're playing it. And he he can go back later and fix those those uh, adventures in <laughs> harmony. <laughs> Everything was just starting to come together. Then the band was maturing. Technology was kind of there. You're learning how to how to work within the studio. Why why was it the last record? Well, because we had in the in the fiscal world, in the economic world of the record business, um, we sold no records. So they have no interest in keeping us around. We had our bad behavior was such that our unprofessionalism was such that we couldn't even get booked. We had, we had, you know, like no shows on gigs so much that all the major promoters uh, were, wouldn't hire us. And Bill Graham blackballed us. Was there a particular event? Why, why uh, uh, Bill Graham did that? Yeah, we, we were, Electra wanted to print, present us to New York City with a big bang. So they wanted us to play at the Fillmore East. And we went into New York, and there was a radical, militant radical group in the community and around the Lower East Side, around the theater, who Bill had given the theater to on Wednesday nights for local bands and poets and political organizing, whatever they wanted to do. So they were pissed off that we were going to take their Wednesday night. So we said, you know what? We'll come and play for you guys for free the, w the week before unannounced. And they said, great. And we did. And it was, everything was, you know, good. And the next week at the big event that Electra promoted, um, they demanded like 50 tickets and Graham wasn't, you know, Graham wasn't a punk and he <laughs> said, go fuck yourself. And they were, they were hanging out in the front of the theater and he went out to throw them off onto the sidewalk and they got into a fight and somebody hit Graham in the face with a chain and broke his nose. And Graham fought it was Rob Tyner that did it because the dude that he was fighting with was a white boy with Afro and Tyner, you know, was, there wasn't a whole lot of them walking around. <laughs> right. So Graham thought it was the MC five that, that beat him up. 
so he said, you know, you will never play in my venues, and you, you won't play in any venues of any the other promoters that I'm associated with. And we didn't. So, you know, by the, I mean, Atlantic only let us make that record out of their contractual obligation. You know, the the entire promotion campaign consisted of one half-page ad in Rolling Stone magazine that we had to share with a new band that they were promoting called the Allman Brothers. So it was pretty much DOA. DOA, my brother, DOA. It comes to the bitter, bitter end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was there a discussion between the band that this was it, or everyone just kind of went their separate ways and it was just unspoken, everyone knew? No, it, 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 we struggled on for maybe another year. Uh, we, we, had, we made a toehold in Europe, and so we, we started going over there on tour, and we got new management in London, a guy named Ronan O'Reilly, took over the band's management, and Ronan founded uh, Pirate Radio in England, Radio Caroline. And uh, he tried to save the MC5, uh, and, he, and he did a good job. He, he, he almost saved it, but not quite. <laughs> good effort. He tried to get us a new record contract, and, uh, and the, uh, the night that the record executive showed up, uh, certain band members got too high and fell off the stage, and it was a big fucking mess and it was awful the end of it came up we had booked uh, this was, i think it was like our sixth or seventh tour of europe it was going to be the best tour yet it was going to be like two weeks in italy and scandinavian television and the money was very good and two days before the tour uh, tyner quit the band and then when tyner quit the band uh, thompson quit the band Michael Davis had already been fired from the band. So Fred Smith and I got on a plane and flew to London and met a pickup drummer in the dressing room of the first show with no lead singer. And, you know, I didn't even know the lyrics to half the songs. You know, I got to go out and try and sing these tunes. And, it, of course, it was terrible. And the, the tour was a nightmare. So we go, finally we go back to Detroit and there's one last New Year's Eve gig at the Grandy Ballroom for like, I don't know, $500 or something. And, you know, everybody was there, all the original guys, and we're playing, and there's a few hundred kids, and it was just so awful and just such a spirit-crushing night. I just, and that, that was truly the end of, of that era of that band and those people. But I'll tell you that it was not unique. I mean, this is a story of rock bands, you know. How many thousands of bands have come and gone over the last 30 years? You know, they, they don't come to stay, they go. Very few uh, survive over decades. Usually, ones, usually the ones that survive achieve a great success right out of the box, you know. The Who, The Rolling Stones, R.E.M., U2. These bands all had hit records pretty much right out of the box. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's almost impossible uh, to, to survive in, you know, in, a, in a rock band. And you see them come and you see them go, but mostly you see them go. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. I mean, so many bands, they, you know, in like a lion, out like a lamb. Uh, but, but few have the sort of renaissance and the impact that, uh, that the MC5 did. They're now being revisited and, and uh, regaled, and, and the inspiration uh, that was created during that very brief tornado of a period. Uh, but uh, it, it's good to be able to see that sort of appreciation come back, particularly when you're still around to be able to enjoy it. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't say that, I'm, uh, that I disagree with you. You know, it, it's great to be recognized for work that you do and, and to, to experience uh, uh, camaraderie and mutual respect of, of my fellow musicians, you know, who really, those are the guys I'm actually playing for anyway. And, 
if, if, if it's, you know, what I did was important to them and they appreciate it, that, that's meaningful for me. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm proud of the work we did. And, and, you know, records are like, you know, little time capsules. And it seems like every couple of generations, the next generation discovers the MC5. And uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, it, you know... I'm telling you, I put this album on the other day, and my seven-year-old has reacted to it. You know, it's a, uh, it's you've got a, you you've got you you've got fire in a bottle, uh, and and most yeah, musicians yeah. most musicians aren't fortunate enough to be able to do that, uh, and, uh, and and you have and 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 you've had a a life well lived. You've you've certainly you certainly made it quite interesting for yourself. <laughs> Uh, so 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 let's talk let's talk briefly about the uh the 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 next chapter of your life where you know you uh uh, right now your focus is on this project jail guitar doors can you speak a little bit about the genesis of this project well it's no secret i served a, a federal prison term in the 1970s and while i was uh, incarcerated, a new music form emerged called punk rock. And the clash, the British, wonderful British band, um, wrote a song about me going to prison, uh, called jail guitar doors. I was thrilled when I got out and found out about it and thought it was a, a terrific show of solidarity from brother musicians and, uh, you know, met them when they came to town and we became friends and we're still f- good friends. And, uh, and then, that, that, you know, that was the end of it. I thought, well, this is a nice thing they did. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to get on with my life. Mm-hmm. And I watched over the next 30 years as more and more people just like me went to prison for longer sentences under worse conditions. And it pissed me off. And I've been an activist all my life. And uh, I decided there, I, I'm, there, I had to do something. You know, there, I think one person can make a difference. And, and what can I do? I'm a musician and I'm an ex-convict. And maybe I could be a bridge between these two communities and maybe I could take musicians into prisons and do concerts. That's kind of the best I could come up with. And so I got a bunch of musicians together, uh, Tom Morello and, and Jerry Cantrell and Gilby Clark and Don was and handsome Dick Manitoba and Perry Farrell. And we all went into Sing Sing, the infamous maximum security facility in New York. And I took a, the wonderful British activist and tu- troubadour Billy Bragg with me into that prison. And uh, as we were getting ready to perform, I noticed Billy had a guitar he was playing, and on the guitar was written Jail Guitar Doors. And I, I, hmm, I hadn't thought about that since I got out of prison. And I said, Bill, what's up with that? He said, oh, it's an old Clash B-side. Have you ever heard it? <laughs> and I said, Bill... The song's about me. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, well, what are the lyrics? He said, right. Let me tell you about wine and his deals of cocaine. And he said, oh, bloody fucking hell. I forgot all about that. It is about you. And I adore this man. I love him so much and admire him so much. And he's such a solid brother. Um, but, you know, I assured him <laughs> This was no big deal. And he started to tell me that he had launched an independent initiative in England to provide guitars for prisoner rehabilitation. And he decided to name it Jail Guitar Doors to honor Joe Strummer's life's life's work. And by the time we finished the concert and we're on the bus back to the city, I said, you know, this is a good thing that you're doing in Britain. Uh, you're you're English, and uh, but you know, I'm an American, and I'm a, an American musician, and I'm also a, a ex-convict. And um, it's 
I'm an activist too. And, you know, I want to take this on for the United States. And he said, good, because I was just about to task you with it. (laughs) Yeah. He he, he said, you're the only one that can do it, Wayne, (laughs) because you've been inside, you know how the system works. So on that day, Billy Bragg, my wife, Margaret Kramer, and I formed Jail Guitar Doors USA. Today, our, prison, our instruments are in over 60 American prisons. We run songwriting workshops in county jails in Los Angeles, Chicago, San Diego, uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, and we're working to set some up in uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia now. And we still have the program going that we started at Sing Sing. We're starting to work upstream. We're uh, we're going into the California Youth Authority, um, and we just started some some songwriting workshop programs there. Mm. Recently, you've been in the news for some shows that were around some of the California correctional facilities. Can you talk about those a little bit? On Wednesday of this week, <clears throat> we had planned to present Prophets of Rage to 900 um, prisoners at uh, the Norco State Prison uh, in here in Southern California. And uh, the concert was, you know, a reward for prisoners that had worked hard to rehabilitate themselves. Um, and the, the facility management, uh, the administration was 100% behind us, and we have a longstanding relationship with them. And about an hour before showtime, um, the California Department of Corrections headquarters in Sacramento uh, denied us access and denied us the ability to put on the show. So we got. So what happened was there there were some elements in the community that phoned in anonymous calls to the local newspapers, media, and the Department of Corrections, that we were aligned with the Black Lives Matter movement, and that we were going to foment a riot in the prison, and that people were going to be hurt, and so they canceled the concert. Um, this This is a very sophisticated political strategy by um by certain elements in uh in the corrections industry um it's nothing new to me you know when you when you when you go to prison you start to learn how arbitrary things can be uh how how arbitrary decisions are and that you have no recourse you have no one to appeal to that they're not answerable to anybody so what we did is um we set up a band on the street outside the prison <laughs> and uh and we rocked them and you know we were able to successfully maintain our good relationship with the prison staff and the warden she even came out afterwards and thanked us and said that men behind the fence were all in in their housing units and they all pressed up against the windows and they heard everything we were saying to them and they heard the music and they they know that, you know, we promised we'd come there and play and we kept our promise and, and uh, you know, the local police were uh, cooperative with us and the city manager was cooperative and the prison guards were cooperative and we were able to really make uh, lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> so what they attempted to what they attempted to do <clears throat> blew up in their face. <laughs> yeah, you're. Uh, I imagine by this time uh, you're pretty used to people fucking with you, and uh, this was a, an interesting way to send a message not only to the prisoners to say yes, we did keep our promise, and you know we're here for you, but also to send a message to the people who you know, hide behind that anonymity and uh, those sort of uh, tactics. Uh, the chicken shit tactics yeah. uh, to to say yeah, yeah we, we are here yeah yeah and we're in, and we're not going anywhere you know yeah. the the the, the uh, people that run California's prisons know um, that you know we are of service to them and you know uh, the federal government g- gave us the authority to to do good work when they assigned us the five hundred one c three 
tax status, mm-hmm. um, and we're not deterred. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we are, we are, we are moving forward. You know, this is <laughs> so. So uh, yeah. So you know, uh, if people want to uh, help us, you know, they can go to jailguitardoors dot org. And uh, they can make a donation, you know, uh, funding is is a problem. You know, it's uh, I, my experience has been that if you want to save the baby seals or puppies, money comes flying out of people's pockets. If you want to help save human beings, adult felony offenders, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> it, you're, uh, yeah, it's a tough hill to climb on that one. Um, it's a you, hard sell. You also have uh, some some gigs coming a, uh, around uh, to to raise funds and to raise awareness. Uh, there's a big show coming up in Los Angeles, I believe, September 9th. Uh, can you tell Correct. us a bit about that? Sure. It's our it's our third annual uh, Jail Guitar Doors uh, event fundraising event. Uh, rock out um, and stay out. Uh, and it's at the the most beautiful venue on the planet Earth. Uh, the Ford Amphitheater is a spectacular facility. Uh, holds uh, just under a thousand people. There is not a bad seat in the venue. It's an open air venue with the beautiful open uh, California hills behind it, and uh, the sound is perfect. The lighting is perfect. The the setup is, you know, there's food and and space and there's parking and uh, so we're we're uh, we're lining up uh, our our artists now. I've got I've got a couple of great um, um, graduates from the JGD program, um, men that were serving time that played our guitars and and who are out now and doing well. They're going to come and perform and. Uh, and we've got some good uh, local bands, and we've got uh, I'm going to play, of course, and and uh, uh, we've got we're we're talking with a couple of um, headliners, and I you know until I confirm it, I it, it would be unwise to let's just to say, say su- surprise so guests. So, <laughs> yeah, so and so might show up. You know? <laughs> but, you know, in the past we've had you know Tom Morello has has played with. Uh, We've had uh, Jackson Brown and and Ben Harper and uh, you know really wonderful wonderful artist activists that uh, are sympathetic to what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So you're you're going to have graduates of the program as well. So 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 not only does this program help rehabilitate uh, folks inside the correctional facilities, but it's also a bit of a farm team for opening acts. <laughs> <laughs> good yes <laughs> i see your strategy you're very very smart um so so look wait i want to close this discussion out on a high first off thank you very much for spending uh so much uh, uh of your time and energy and going deep uh into this uh, a lot of our audience is really you know uh well, like myself we we like to know about our records we like to know everything about them we're fascinated with the stories behind them and and you certainly filled a lot of gaps uh in that knowledge and provided a lot of perspective so really want to thank you for your time as a as a bit of a way to close out this discussion on a high note and and to honor the work that you're doing we reach out to one of our show sponsors voyage air guitars about the jail guitar doors program Uh, voyage air guitars is a guitar manufacturer they're in modesto uh, and they've agreed to donate some gear to the jail guitar doors program uh, wow. I want to definitely wow. call that out. Um, in the last 48 hours, they've started working with, uh, with your manager and they'll, they'll sort it out. They've, they've started the email trail going, but, uh, um, it really is to honor the work that you're doing there, Wayne. I'm knocked out. This is, this is really, really sweet of you, man. I, I really appreciate that. And, and, you know, speaking for, for the fellows, the voiceless fellows, uh, and women that, populate the prisons um they appreciate it too this this um, it means a great deal thank you so much that's that's really thoughtful and generous and uh, and uh kind of you I, I i really appreciate it no worries uh, look uh, you know you're doing the hard work i made a couple phone calls and the gear is coming from voyage air guitar uh, dot com so uh, fantastic if- 
All right, Wayne. Well, I'm going to let you go. I know you've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Godspeed to you, man. Take care, mate. Cheers.